grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the punch bowl. Ryan, take it away. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this uh, punch bowl number one. Like Hannah said, it's just like the Super Bowl, except for there's no sports and it's all drinks. And everybody you see in front of you has been training for this for years. Um, so, uh, my name is Brian Cushing. I am the program director uh, at Locust Grove. Uh, it's an exciting place to be. Uh, if you haven't been to Locust Grove, we were the last home of uh, General George Rogers Clark during the last nine years of his life. Uh, it was not owned by George Rogers Clark. It was uh, owned by his brother-in-law, uh, Major William Cron. Uh, they started building around 1792, completed around 1795. Uh, we did uncover evidence at the Filson uh, Historical Club uh, or the Historical Society of, uh, of a distillery at Locust Grove. And so that's kind of what's led to this conversation. William Cron, uh, the owner of Locust Grove, was a part of a still purchase, a 66-gallon still, uh, with his brother-in-law, Owen Guathney. And it wasn't really a huge surprise because we already knew that he had a mill and that he had orchards. And we'll get a little bit more into, the, um, into, into why that is, why that wasn't a surprise, probably as this, as this conversation uh, moves forward. So uh, just a reminder to please ask questions uh, through the chat or email. And as this conversation wraps up, uh, Hannah is going to uh, send those to me. And so I'll start to distribute those to our, uh, to our panelists. So please keep your microphones muted. Uh, and the idea for the punch bowl uh, is kind of the kickoff for our Odyssey project. And I'm really going to leave it to, uh, to Brian Austin uh, from Colonial Williamsburg to talk more about uh, what the Odyssey project is and kind of what we're hoping for. Uh, but what we'll be seeing here today in the Punch Bowl is we've just got, that this was the dream team I wanted to get together for this. And we'll just be looking at distilling in the East and distilling as it moved West. What was the same? What changed? How that was? Uh, and we've got a good crew here. So at this hour and a half, it's not going to seem like much at all. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Brian Austin at Colonial Williamsburg. Thanks, Brian. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to see, well, to be around people in this uh, uncertain time. But it's a wonderful time. Uh, it's a wonderful time to uh, reevaluate how we as cultural institutions and uh, people who love cultural institutions can come together in a time where we can all be neighbors. Uh, so uh, for myself, I play James Madison at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Colonial Williamsburg, we're a living history museum that has about 94 years of uh, experience trying to um, reawaken the past. And uh, so from that, uh, we, we faced the various um, uh, dilemmas that we all find at the, this time. But with that comes awesome opportunities. And with that, like Brian said, is this uh, Odyssey project where uh, we, we find ourselves for the first time really next door neighbors with every other museum and cultural institution uh, through our friend, the internet. And so uh, from that, the Odyssey project is, um, is really a way in which we can come together and talk about not only the beginnings of English settlement and settlement on this continent, but how it stretched westward. It was a no-brainer between Colonial Williamsburg and historic Locust Grove uh, because it's such a small step and there are so many connections between the two entities in the settlement of Kentucky. And in truth, what a better way to talk about the spirit of settlement than through spiritous liquors. Um, for James Madison, he had a brandy still on his property, a peach orchard, uh, peach brandy being a huge staple of colonial American economy and colonial American libation. And um, more than that, Williamsburg was a place that was in many regards framed around the communal aspect of drinking. That might sound uh, funny, but it's true. It's how it united so many people. Um, in many regards, uh, America started in a bar when a bunch of politicians found themselves out of work and well, do what probably so many of us do, walk down the street and go to a bar, the Apollo Room of the Raleigh Tavern where uh, the call for the first Continental Congress came from. Uh, I think it's really great that we find ourselves at May 15th uh, because it's a really special day in Virginia and especially in Williamsburg. Uh, May 15th is when the uh, unanimous resolution for independence was passed a unanimous resolution which made its way to Philadelphia and would pave the way for the Declaration of Independence. And of course, how do you think those statesmen and politicians like James Madison or Patrick Henry celebrated that milestone? They drank. Uh, 
<laughs> famously, uh, they stepped outside of the Capitol and there were parades and posts to the Congress, to Washington, and the Union of the States. Apparently, there were so many toasts that the next day they decided to call for a day of uh, fasting, prayer, and recovery from all of that celebrating. So uh, my, my role here today is uh, not only to facilitate any questions you have about you know, early America, but also to be your official Toastmaster for the event. Uh, now, uh, the proper bumper toast, as it was called in the 18th century, uh, was framed around this part of the glass, which was called the bump of it. Uh, a bumper toast, and thankfully the mug was not as big as this, involved you doing the toast and then finishing your drink as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, I encourage moderation because this is an hour and a half and we've got a few toasts ahead of us. Uh, so, so with that, I think I, it's important just to kick off this event and I'm going to give the first toast of Punch Bowl One. And so here is to the four hinges of friendship, swearing, stealing, lying, and drinking. When you swear, swear to your country. When you steal, steal from bad company. When you lie, lie with love. And when you drink, drink with me. Cheers. 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 So thank you so much, Brian. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Brian again, uh, Brian Austin, two more times. Uh, this evening with more uh, with more toasts. Uh, so one more reminder to please keep your microphones turned off. That will uh, keep the focus on the conversation at hand. Uh, and again, you can set, you can put your um, your questions in the in the chat or in an email, and then Hannah's going to get those to me at the end, and we'll go over them. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. First up, we've got Steve Bayshore at Mount Vernon, and I do want to. Um, uh, say one word about uh, Steve. He uh, was very generous when we were starting our distillery project at Locust Grove. He had uh, me and one of our um, one of our distillery committee members, uh, Melissa Alexander, out to uh, Mount Vernon, just let us work with him for a few days, and that really established a cornerstone of our understanding of the process. So Steve Bayshore is the Director of Historic Trades at George Washington's Mount Vernon. In this position, he oversees the interpretation, operations, and maintenance of Washington's distillery and grist mill, as well as the Pioneer Farm and Blacksmith Shop. Steve is a traditional miller and distiller by trade and has been operating, interpreting, and repairing historic water mills for 26 years. Since 2007, he has been distilling at George Washington's reconstructed distillery, producing rye whiskey, bourbon, single malt whiskey, rum, as well as peach and apple brandy. He has been a spirits judge for the American Craft Spirits Association and for the world of whiskeys. Steve has traveled extensively in the United States, England, and Europe, researching windmills, water mills, and distilleries, and lectures regularly on these subjects. Aaron Hollis from West Overton Village. Uh, West Overton, I really wanted to have involved with this because uh, they were working on their distillery project about the same time as we were working on our distillery project at Locust Grove. And so um, uh, at least one staff person and one a board member from West Overton came to visit us at Locust Grove, and so when we started talking about this East-West, uh, it, so it, I really wanted to have that uh, Pennsylvania rye uh, kind of element in this discussion. So uh, Aaron Hollis is the Director of Education at West Overton Village and Museums in Scottsdale, Pennsylvania. He began working as a docent at the, uh, at the museum eight years ago, but became Director of Education after earning an MA in Public History in 2018. Although long associated with whiskey history, it is only within the last few years that West Overton has begun to embrace its distilling roots, and Aaron is overseeing the research and programming to make that possible. As a southwestern Pennsylvania native, a region was dotted with rye whiskey distilleries, Aaron is partial to rye. Outside of work, he enjoys walking his dog Wicket, yes, the Ewok, vintage photography, and traveling. And last but not least, we have Alan Bishop, also has been very generous uh, to the Locust Grove Distillery Project. He popped up at our opening. We kept in touch, um, and he has helped us out every step of the way. He joins us down there for mashing, has helped us work out, work out our recipes. He had me up to French Lake to work with him for a few days, uh, laid some serious science on me that I'm still trying to pick apart. Uh, so we're very happy to have Alan here with us. Uh, Alan Bishop is a self-taught distiller and historian of Southern Indiana's deep distilling heritage. Alan grew up alongside generations of tobacco farmers and legal and illicit distillers. Alan began his own education in earnest at the age of 15 on the pot still he built with the help of his father and grandfather. 
Despite his family's background and having been exposed to the art at from an incredibly young age, his father and grandfather refused to teach Allen how to distill, preferring that he figure it out on his own. By his mid-20s, Allen had pursued uh, home distillation as far as he could. Uh, the time came to take the next step. Allen was hired at Copper and Kings, where he oversaw the production of Chinon Blanc, Colin Bard, and Muscat grapes, as well as apple brandy, absinthe, and the blending of products for bottling. After two years at Copper and Kings, Allen got the call to come to what he refers to as the right side of the river to join the team at Spirits of French Lick. Allen is head alchemist at Spirits of French Lick in West Baden, Indiana. His focus as master distiller is on using historic Hoosier methods of distilling in a modern facility. This includes propagating his own yeast strains, using alternative grain types, unique barrel maturation, and low entry proof with no chill filtration. From these methods, their Lee W. Their Lee w. Sinclair four grain was born. Alan considers it an honor to have been invited to participate in the Mount Vernon distilling program, and he frequently volunteers at the historic Locust Grove Farm Distillery. Currently, Alan is working with the Indiana DNR to reestablish the historic distillery at Spring Mill State Park in Lawrence County, Indiana. The goal is to turn it into a, into a working educational distillery. So that is, those are our panelists. Uh, one more reminder to please uh, keep uh, your mics muted, and we will commence the conversation with gentlemen talking about what we're drinking today. Um, and what I've got here actually is we're drink I've got Cassius Clay bourbon. This was a generous gift from a Locust Grove volunteer who popped up at my place on New Year's Eve, uh, Catherine Stevenson. And the reason why I chose Cassius Clay for today is that um, he and Robert Wycliffe fought a duel at Locust Grove in 1841. And when that happened, the owner of Locust Grove at the time, John Cronsey, took them down to the mill to fight the duel. Not the old mill, not the broken down mill, not the place where the mill used to be, but the mill. And so Alan and I have, have just kind of started a conversation of uh, the likelihood of the still, maybe uh, actually still, uh, the still was purchased in 1808, maybe still operating there uh, in the early 1840s. So that's just the very beginning of the conversation. And whoever would like to jump in next, gentlemen, what are you drinking? So I'm a true Hoosier at heart and uh, might be a little egotistical, but I'm drinking my own product tonight. Um, Indiana was a, Southern Indiana in particular, was the center for apple brandy production for about 60 years in the United States and most of the world. So we are in a, a region uh, made up of six counties, which was once called the Black Forest of Southern Indiana that was filled with 155 legal operating apple brandy distilleries. And we are the first distillery in over 100 years to make a true Hoosier style apple brandy. So this is the Old Clifty Hoosier Apple Brandy. It's actually a picture of the Old Clifty Mill and Distillery just north of Campbellsburg, Indiana, um, that closed down somewhere in the around 1901 or so and was making about 22,000 gallons of apple brandy the hard way uh, for years and years and years. So pretty good stuff. And I pulled out uh, a bottle of one of our special collaboration whiskeys that we did in 2012. This is the George Washington Distillers Reserve Single Malt. And this was probably the most special project we did. Uh, we had uh, Bill Lumsden from Glenmore and G, Andy Kent from Cardew, and John Campbell from Lafroig, along with Dave Pickerel. And we did a very small number of bottles to raise money for Mount Vernon. And uh, I'm lucky to have a couple of them. But uh, that was a great project. And that the Scottish connection we can talk about later too. Of course, the 18th century in America, the role of the Scots, but at Mount Vernon in particular, the farm manager whose idea the distillery was, was a Scottish gentleman named James Anderson. So if you, if you think about Scottish influence on America, it's quite deep in the 18th century. And I think that's something we could maybe bounce around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, being from Pennsylvania, I of course am drinking some rye. So I have here some, some dad's hat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Dad's Hat is a, is a rye that's, this is 80% rye, 20% malted barley, so it's pretty close to the old Monongahela style of rye. And uh, Herman Mahalik there at Dad's Hat, he's been a supporter of ours at the museum for a number of years in our ongoing efforts to open and maintain an educational distillery. And uh, Herman's from this area, a county where in 1900 there were 12 distilleries all producing rye whiskey, and among them is the largest rye whiskey distillery in the world. So a huge industry that Herman has, has researched and is familiar with, so his product is, um, is very reminiscent of the Monongahela style. Well, thank you, Joan. 
Um, to start the conversation, I know at, um, at Locust Grove, one of our uh, big motivations to, to undertake a historic distillery project over anything else at that moment was an enticing hook to bring our visitors into the story of agriculture, that this wasn't just a standalone thing, it wasn't just a pretty place, but this was, that this is an agricultural system where everything worked together with distilling very much being a part of that. Uh, so we've talked about rye, we've talked about uh, apples and all this. Let's, uh, let's, let's expound a little bit to begin with on, um, on, on, on the way agriculture guides what happens in distilling in a place. Yeah, distilling is inherently agricultural. I mean, everything uh, pre-industrialization, and, and I mean, still agricultural today, but everything pre-industrialization was based on the cycles and the seasons, including distilling. And it's still, for most settlers, um, most of the peasant class from Europe, in fact, you know, it was, it was, it was not necessarily... In some ways it was a luxury, but in a lot of ways it was just another piece of farm equipment. You know, it was another way of processing. It was another way of using what you had on hand, um, you know, either for yourself or you're talking about time periods within which, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of access to, uh, to medicine in, in the modern sense of things. And so alcohol itself is a great solvent. Um, really alcohol in a lot of ways, in a lot of different times throughout history, probably saved a lot of lives. Um, so it was something that was necessary. Uh, it was an adjunct to agriculture. Um, I doubt that any of these early farm distillers looked at their stills the way us modern distillers do and think of them as, uh, as something romantic. <laughs> you know, they were, they were another, another thing uh, to make life a little easier and a little, a little more pleasant, maybe be able to, to trade a little here and there um, and bring in some things that you don't otherwise have because Although we tend to think of historical figures as being completely self-sustainable, they very rarely ever were. So a lot more focus on trade. If you have, uh, you know, a, a nice trade item, you can get a premium from. Yeah, and, and to that point, uh, carrying it forward, turning that heavy solid grain into liquid is a form of preservation. Uh, storing grain by itself, especially in the 18th century, is very susceptible to, to rot, infestation from rodents, from insects. And so turning that whiskey into a high proof alcohol preserves it, improves, and enables you to preserve other things in it. And also if you need to transport that grain to a market uh, that's very far away, liquid in a grain in a liquid form is much more efficient to transport than grain in a solid form. That's one point I think we try to bring up the Lotus Grove a lot is that when, when people see a, a home place in Kentucky, they, they want to jump to the um, to the kind of self-sufficient narrative, the, kind of, the stereotypical kind of pioneer narrative. But in William Cron's case at Locust Grove, um, he, he had the still, he had his mill. And so he was certainly distilling grain and, and fruit. But we know from his purchase records that he wasn't necessarily, we don't know how much, if any of that, was making it to his table because he was still buying the beer and rum. Those are the things he preferred, but this was the way to get the maximum use off of his crop. And now, Steve, I know you have, uh, we were a small farm distillery, but Steve, your operation, uh, you're talking about industrial level distillery. So how, how is that different where it plays into agriculture? Well, I think in that time period of the, from the mid 1700s on, the growth of uh, distilling, particularly in the big cities, initially was rum. You know, we were a rum drinking colony and you'll find about 143 rum distilleries between New York and, and Carolinas. In that time period, the revolution really uh, begins to break with that because we don't want to trade with British goods and tr certainly there were embargoes where we couldn't get the material we needed. So you can see whiskey taking off and that's where Washington entered that business rather late in you know the in history of the early republic. Um, but it's interesting in our research he had two stills he bought in 1760. So when Mount Vernon was a smaller property and let's say it was 3,000 acres then as opposed to the 8,000 it originally became, Washington realized the utility of a still. And uh, you can see those, even I've found repairs to the, the swan neck on one of the stills. And they factor in 1797 because the first operation of a larger scale right there next to the mill, you know, Washington's pretty frugal with money. So when James Anderson proposed this big distillery, he said, well, you can use the cooperage to distill in. And they put those two early stills in there as a test case. What, what made it work for Washington, he was nine miles from a major town in Alexandria, and they're not aging whiskey then, so what he saw was ready cash. And, uh, you know, without the Scottish influence, though, if he hadn't hired James Anderson, I often say on tour in the distillery, if, if Washington hadn't hired Anderson, you would have just seen a great water mill and been on your way 
to your next tour destination because he would have never built it without the expertise. But because of uh, having 8,000 acres, having the good market nearby, it being unaged, Washington realized he could go more industrial. And um, I think that's happening up and down the Eastern seaboard. And that age old battle begins between the farm distiller and the men in the big cities that right, Hamilton right. factored into in his plan for taxation. But I've found records in Scotland in the 18th century that was going on there. Yes. And people want to consolidate. And so they're thinking, how do we get these farm guys out of this and get this into the city? It's one of those battles that's woven through, through the story of history. What's great in this country is liberty was so strong. People got to, you know, there was both going on. But, but I think for Washington, I think he was hesitant about it. You can read in his writings, but with the potential for cash flow, you know, and Anderson's expertise, that's what made it work. And Alan, help me out here. What was the, uh, what was the name of the, uh, the industrial distillery they, they tried to start in Louisville around 1817 and failed? That, that was the Hope Distillery. That yeah. was the, yeah, it was a massive steam boiler distillery, um, really early for its time. Uh, what, late 18 teens, I think. Maybe a little earlier than that. It might have been 1808. I can't remember. Beach, Beach, I think it was like 1816, 1817. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But, uh, massive pot stills, you know, um, thousand gallon pot still uh, apparently had no problem producing, but uh, didn't make very good quality product and it kind of died off. And of course, th at that time, though, you're still dealing with, and this time is back in your agriculture thing too, Brian. Here on the Western side, uh, you know, at that time, you're still dealing with a lot of undeveloped territory. And agriculturally speaking, uh, a lot of the mills here, particularly in Kentucky and Indiana, Ohio, um, they set up distilleries as farm processing services. You know, nobody was was trading money here really at that time. Uh, they were, you know, farmers were bringing their corn in, having it milled and trading on shares. Uh, and when you traded those shares, you know, the mill would keep a certain percentage of the corn, which they don't really need. So they're going to turn it into liquor. Um, but the other thing that happens is when you get your shares back, you can have it back as cornbread or as cornmeal, or you can have it back as corn whiskey, your choice. And uh, I think even if you had a big family, you'd have a hard time going through a couple bushels of cornmeal in a year. So you can imagine how much whiskey was was rolling out of some of those little farm distilleries for the mills. Brian, I wanted to ask you, and, and I know you uh, Aaron can speak to this too, and Alan, because there's the convergence of the settlement of Kentucky is certainly tied to. Maryland and Pennsylvania settlers coming through by land and, and up into the Louisville area and Bardstown area. But the trade down the Ohio from Pittsburgh area, and, and I found records of stills being shipped down to Louisville and the falls being there was, there was no way to go further. So it naturally developed. And then the New Orleans market. So Louisville in that area, Kentucky was in a way geographically perfectly positioned to become a, a hub for all sorts of things. Maybe y'all could speak a little bit Aaron, about Pennsylvania and what you know about came down that way. And I, I traced some of the Maryland families from St. Mary's County, one of which was Basil Hayden Haydens that end up in Kentucky and Beams. So I think that's interesting, kind of a land route and a river route that ends up at Louisville. Aaron, do you want to start on that one? Um, no, you can go ahead and start with that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, again, talking about the stereotypes of Kentucky and things, everybody uh, kind of thinks about it as this out-of-the-way, self-sufficient, hard scramble place. In some ways it was, but uh, in other ways, like Steve said, the Ohio River was such a major thoroughfare um, for um, for goods, and you had to stop there. And I'm also going to apologize if you all have ambient noise. from I live, on, I live in one of three towns left in America with a train running down Main Street. <laughs> so that's why the... Uh, the noise um but but yeah we were at one point it was the westernmost port of call before you know we had access uh, ready access to new orleans and that was a whole set of scandals uh in the early in the early 19th century but um in louisville uh in the early 19th century you could pretty much have whatever you wanted uh if you had the money to get it and if you look at the interior of locust grove the main house you see that it's 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 decorated with all imported uh paints and um wallpaper and things like that so uh, it's like in one way yes we were the most western part of the united states but also all that traffic uh especially the days before the steamship uh when you were coming down on flat boats and it was a one-way trip until you went back around uh it all did have to start there uh and then once new orleans did become more of a factor once we did have access uh to go to the mississippi uh and ship things down river then yeah it, it became very uh that, that kind of cycle that you're talking about coming from east 
to west down to the deep south um yeah it became, became a pretty uh, it made louisville a pretty good good hub for that kind of thing of course we see bourbon kind of being uh born out of that process that river was really you know the highway of its time and for indiana it was crucial as well as kentucky um you know the connection to pennsylvania for southern indiana is very big uh, most of the settlers that ended up in, in the the region that we call the Black Forest of Southern Indiana, Orange, Washington, Lawrence, Crawford, Harrison, Perry County, were German settlers from Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of the early stills that were brought into the territory were brought down the river. And in fact, off of the, uh, the bank of Madison, Indiana, for a period of about 30 years from the late 1700s into the 1800s, there was a store that was a flat boat that was literally anchored off the bank. Uh, and the only thing they sold was distillation equipment to settlers coming into Indiana. Uh, Louisville being a hub, uh, because of the Falls of Ohio, as Steve mentioned, uh, before the locks went on the, on the Falls of Ohio, you really couldn't get around the Falls of Ohio unless you were on the Kentucky side. And so this is something I always point out. I love Kentucky and I love Kentucky bourbon, uh, but all the surrounding states also had limestone water and root corn. And so we know that a lot of bourbon came out of Maysville, Kentucky, uh, or Louisville, Kentucky a little later on, uh, shipping port, et cetera. But a lot of that may have actually come from southern Ohio and southern Indiana as well, because we couldn't ship down the Ohio River from our side. We had to actually cross the river over to the Kentucky side with our barrels in order to even get them down the river. So um, just kind of an interesting aside there. But yeah, that, that river and the connection for us in southern Indiana, like I said, back to Pennsylvania, um, that really built everything for us. So Yeah, and in Pennsylvania, I... I think with the whiskey insurrection that there's this, this belief that all of the distillers ran away to places like Kentucky because it was much more remote and more of a frontier, so tax collectors couldn't find. But a lot of distillers did stay in Pennsylvania, and people moved from the east into Pennsylvania, even in the mid-19th century, like, of course, the Oberholtz doing so in 1803, but the likes of um, John and Henry Large, John Gibson, Philip Hamburger, Sam Thompson, Samuel Dillinger, distillers of Western Pennsylvania who came from places like Philadelphia and other cities. And instead of moving on further south via the Ohio, they stayed in Southwestern Pennsylvania and, and, and formed a, a whiskey industry there using, using of course, rye. Um, and into the mid to late 19th century, those distilleries are still growing and they're still producing rye. And there's, then they start to use the Ohio uh, to ship their own products uh, via those same avenues. I don't want to dominate. I mean, it's, uh, whiskey is a crucial part of this conversation. We do definitely need to talk about brandy too. But um, let's let, let's talk a little bit about grain bill. Um, when um, uh, when we when people come to Lowest Grove, they talk to us in the distillery. We um, I always tell them that it hadn't become bourbon yet, but the elements of bourbon were there, and so it was a largely corn whiskey, um, as opposed to what you're talking about, Aaron, with with largely rye whiskey. Uh, so what, what are we looking at factor wise? Um, I think everybody probably has a little bit to say about this when, uh, when we're talking about moving west and the, the evolution of what's being produced in Pennsylvania, uh, where you are, Aaron, and, and, uh, in Virginia, where you are, Steve, uh, once you get out here and you're in Kentucky and Indiana with Alan and me, what, what are we looking at changes in agriculture wise that led to that? Does anybody have any comments on that? Well, I think in Virginia and Maryland, and I'm sure Aaron could speak to Pennsylvania more than I, but rye was a cover crop and it wasn't made into a lot of bread flour. It was a crop available cheaply. And I think that's why it found its way into the stills uh, rather than corn, which at Mount Vernon, for instance, corn was the second biggest crop he grew next to wheat. And that was rations that fed over 350 people that lived and worked at Mount Vernon. So Washington, even in his distillery, he ends up having to buy corn from a relative because he can't take all the corn out of his fields and into the still house because he wouldn't be able to feed everyone. So I think rye was the, the, the natural go-to at that time in the East Coast. Skipping the early part of our history and jumping to the mid 19th century, I'd say that's definitely still the case because Abraham Overholt, who, you know, he's on old Overholt still today and he's, he created this village of West Overton and, the, the overall distilling company, by 1850, he's no longer growing any rye that we see in an agricultural census. He's growing wheat, oats, and corn, and in high quality, in high quantities, but he's buying rye from local farms. So it's more profitable for him 
to grow those grains and then mill them and sell them because at this time his mill is out producing his distillery in terms of revenue six to one so his mill is much more profitable profitable for him but instead he's buying his rye to distill so um initially they did grow rye and um said to be you know something coming from uh, the dutch and the germans which the the overholts were but as it becomes more of a business and less about an, a supplement of their farm then they're starting to buy it as well a, a lot of it in the early days especially for the farm distillers was you know the utility so what did you have if you were a farm distiller what grew well in your environment right and so the thing about kentucky and indiana in particular versus the east coast is Kentucky and Indiana don't grow particularly good rye. Now, there were old varieties that have mostly died out now. Um, Roman rye in particular that did do okay here, although it lodged pretty badly. Uh, but the beauty of what we had here in the Ohio Valley is that the Ohio Valley was kind of a, a hub for the trade of corn genetics from different Native American tribes from the East Coast, the West, etc. And so we had some genetics here in the Ohio Valley for corn in particular uh, that weren't necessarily readily available uh, even into the 1830s, 1840s on the East Coast. And some of those genetics are highly recombinant. And so you get very high yielding corn crops compared to some of the corns that you would typically run into, uh, say in, in the areas of Pennsylvania that grew corn, a lot of times they were growing flint corns, uh, which they'll make one ear per stalk. Uh, the ear is not going to be very big, doesn't have good husk coverage, etc. Whereas here we had something much more in line with what we might think of as corn now, although the kernel shape is not exactly the same uh, and the starch content is not exactly the same. But it was here, it was readily available. I can tell you that in Indiana history, if you go into um, uh, Beck's Mill in Washington County, uh, Mr. Beck actually had, had worked underneath George Washington uh, during the revolution, uh, interestingly enough. But he settled where the mill was, not only because of the spring, but because the Delaware um, natives had a village right next to the area where the spring was at, and it was already in cultivation of corn crops. So he immediately cuts a deal with them to say, hey, if, uh, you know, if you'll guarantee me this excess corn crop you have, I'll guarantee you that I will grind your grain for you. Uh, and it was what was on hand as well in the Ohio Valley because that trade between East Coast, West, et cetera, Southwest, uh, there were already, and this is true of the East Coast too, uh, this would be important for those of you who have a brandy tradition, there were already peaches growing here uh, as early as the earliest uh, white settler came into the area. So in the 1600s, people are already finding peach trees and peach orchards throughout southern Indiana and Kentucky, where the natives had traded with natives down in the southwest uh, from Spanish introduced cultivars. And so there's already groves of peaches here. So it's all about what you have, what grows well for you, and what utility you have, uh, at least on the, on the frontier in the early days. Now, if I could ask a question following along our, our discussion here, with the transfer of any technology or peoples, they bring with them the way they do things. And so, Alan, you could probably speak more to this in Indiana, Kentucky. What, what do you think the changes in styles of whiskey making happened over the late 1700s through the 19th century that differentiates it from what we know as Maryland rye, Virginia rye, or Pennsylvania rye, or even our corn whiskeys to what would have been happening around that area. So it, it's really interesting when you get into, and Kentucky's like this too, Eastern Kentucky in particular, you see it a lot. And then here in Southern Indiana, you see a lot of this. So you have a lot of German ancestry, and then you have pockets of Scots, Irish, Scots, Irish, and then Welsh. Um, and it, it's kind of an interesting cultural thing historically Historically, for whatever reason, a lot of the, the Irish settlers and the German settlers didn't get along, but they would always live next to one another for protection. So occasionally you'll see little pieces of technology get passed back and forth. Um, a lot of what was affected here was really, you know, the Germans had a lot of brandy distilling history, uh, whereas, you know, the Welsh in particular uh, and the Scots Irish had a lot of grain distilling history. But when you get into the methodology, of say the traditional Hoosier apple brandy, you'll start to see a mix of all of those methodologies in a way that modern distillers don't think about. So um, a good example is if we, if we put our Hoosier apple brandy that we've made to the specs um, of what an apple brandy here in Southern Indiana was in a brandy competition on the West Coast, they don't know what to make of it because they have a very 
French tradition of brandy. So this brandy has much more in common with grain whiskey than it does traditional Calvados. And that's because those cultures are directly influencing one another. Um, a little later on, uh, call it the late 1800s, after the farm distillers are starting to have some success here in Southern Indiana, uh, you start to see them transition a little bit away from a pot still and go towards that Maryland style three chamber still for apple brandy production. Uh, the three chamber never was hugely popular across the United States and, and there are very few bourbon producers using it in Kentucky, but it's an interesting correlation between uh, the Germans in Maryland using the three-chamber for rye whiskey and the Hoosiers here in southern Indiana using the three-chamber for apple brandy. So um, there's definitely some cultural trade-off for sure. So before we get too far, um, something that I think everybody's mentioned so far except me that, that really interests me is oats. Um, let, let's talk about the place of oats in whiskey in the late 18th, early 19th century. I know, my, as a matter of fact, my, my runner up for Cassius Clay today was, um, was uh, Whiskey Row uh, from uh, Kentucky Artisan Distillery, which is a wonderful whiskey. Uh, the only reason why I don't have it is because we're all a little paranoid about money right now. And I'm, I'm kind of sticking to the cheap stuff that I'm getting. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing stuff. It's a four grain bourbon, uh, which Alan does also. And um, Kentucky Artisan is helping us out at Locust Grove by taking some of the, some of the mashes uh, that we prepare there and actually running them through the process in their R&D department uh, and seeing where we get. But um, oats is something we've talked a little bit about, and so um, I think everybody's mentioned it so far. So let's talk a little bit about oats, where that falls and what that does uh, to whiskey, because I don't think a lot of people really think of it these days. Definitely they don't. Um... That was one of the first grains I experimented with when I started distilling as a, as a kid was oats because I didn't think that anybody was using them. I thought, why don't you use oats for anything? Why wouldn't you? Farmers still in Southern Indiana, mostly Amish, you'll see a lot of oat fields around the Amish area. So knew they grew well here, knew they had to be used. Later on, you find out, you know, if you read your history, especially in Kentucky, oats and oat malt were very popular for bourbon in the, in the mid 1800s, uh, around 1855, 1860. Uh, and really up until the introduction of the low rectification Kentucky column still, they were very popular. And I suspect they went away because they tend to, to clump a little bit. They're very sticky. They probably wouldn't run that well on a column still. Um, I'm sure people can figure out how to run them, but I don't think they probably did all that well. Uh, they're very sweet. They distill exactly like they smell and they taste exactly like oats do. They're, they have a very creamy mouthfeel. They give a full bodied whiskey. Um, they change the profile completely. You know, if you throw some oats into a bourbon mash in particular uh, with a little bit of rye, uh, you get almost like a, a snickerdoodle uh, cookie sort of characteristic from it, which is kind of fun. Uh, Brian and I have talked about this and because we try to keep things, everything at Locust Grove that, that what I help out with and he's gracious enough, you know, he lets me come in and do some things. Um, We've talked about the fact that, you know, these farmers, they were just using whatever they had a lot of times, whatever came in, whatever grains they could get a hold of that were, you know, decent, they could run through the still. But not only that, you know, you got to imagine these guys, humans are what they are and things are still what they are. So if you buy, if you buy grain right now, you might get a few flakes of, you know, whatever grain was left in that truck the last time uh, that they emptied it. So you got to imagine these farmers wagons that they were, if they were buying a, a load of rye. Maybe that load of rye, that wagon didn't get cleaned out real well, and maybe 10% of that load was oats, you know, or whatever else, you know, whatever grains were on the farm at that time. So um, I think that introduces some fun things and some variabilities and some uh, some inconsistencies, which were probably pretty common in farm distillers. Uh, but there were certainly people using oats on purpose and, and with good reason and good cause for flavor, but also because, again, that's what they had available to them. And if it grew well and they could get it, they were going to use it. Our working title for that batch, whenever we get around to experimenting with, with is uh, "Old Dirty Wagon." <laughs> there we go. That's right. That's a selling point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oats to me, it's like I always find uh, it's roundness is is the term I apply to the to the flavor that it adds adds to whiskey, and it's like a, it's the same thing that I like about port. I, I, honestly, I know that might be a weird comparison, but it's all it's this, it's this roundness of mouthfeel. Uh, that yeah, that oats and bourbon. Sort of long chain fatty acid roundness that you get from them. Yeah, I, get, I, I could see that with pork for sure. So, and that little bit of sweetness that comes through as well. So, right. Well, it is time to toss this back to our Toastmaster, Brian Austin. Let's, let's have another toast. <laughs> 
as we work through this conversation. I, I, I think first and foremost, I should say, I, I think we need to market a sampler pack at the end of this because ever since uh, I heard what everybody was drinking, I just got thirstier and thirstier. <laughs> and well, I, don't know, I don't know why Brian hadn't sent us all some of these test batches. It, that went it, off it, it's, it's, only, it's only gotten worse. I'll send all of you my address and I'll just quality <laughs> control everything. Yes. We're very uh, early stages. <laughs> this, is, this is a fascinating conversation and I'm, I'm so grateful for the expertise and the history that's been shared. It's, it, it really is, it, I think for, especially for us in Williamsburg, it makes such a connection with so much of, of what we study and what we look at and how it, it transitions. So I, I will say thank you gentlemen for that. And I, I'm, I hope my bank account is uh, rich enough to be able to afford uh, picking up some of the things because y'all are good advertisers. Uh, so this next one is a bit of a, a, a tongue teaser. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to bear with me as I read it, but all the same, everybody raise your glasses from Munich to New Orleans to Kentucky to Virginia. Now I, friend, drink to you, friend, as my friend drank to me. And I, friend, charge you, friend, as my friend charged me. That you, friend, drink to your friend, as my friend drank to me. And the more we drink together, friend, the merrier we will be. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Back to you, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Um, so, do we want to, not, not that we need to migrate away from whiskey at all, um, but is it time to maybe say a few words on brandy? Because I know that's a big uh, aspect of Steve's operation and Alan's operation. It's a really interesting part of, uh, of American distilling history that I think that we've forgotten a lot of. Could we spend, before we do that, just two minutes, somebody had a question on, we, no one's mentioned hops in whiskey. Yes. In our, in our early batches at Mount Vernon working with Dave Pickerel, you know, we had water coming in from a city hookup that we filtered, but Dave said, let's put hops in there as an antibacterial kind of thing. And that was in our early batches, that's what we did. And I've had some hopped whiskey as well. So maybe just a couple words about that over time. And then I think brandy is certainly the next topic to get into. Yeah, I think that's a great topic, Steve, for sure. Cause that, that's something that comes up a lot in historic whiskey making and it depends on the region you're in. Um, Hops were a big thing on the East Coast in, in adjusting the, the pH of the whiskey. Of course, they didn't know that that's what they were necessarily adjusting. They just knew that they were souring things, and it kept it from going bad. Um, it was also a huge thing, to some extent, in Kentucky with maintaining your yeast strain if you're actually going to culture your own yeast that you caught from the environment. Uh, kind of a funny aside, here in southern Indiana, hops were never really used for distilling. Um, they were a huge deal again on the East Coast, especially in New York. New York was really the center of that whole thing. So there was a region here uh, that later became known as the Hop Thompson region in southern Indiana. And I'll get to that momentarily because it's a really funny story. Uh, gentleman who came here, uh, Mr. Hammersley and then Hugh Hamer of Spring Mill fame. Uh, if you've ever been to Spring Mill State Park, Hugh Hamer was the owner of that. He originally worked for a man named James Hammersley, who was from New York at Cave River Valley, uh, the old Clifty distillery that I mentioned earlier. Uh, word that there were five distilleries in this little district got back to New York, which is where they were from. A gentleman named Joel Cockins decided that he was going to get rich because of the number of distilleries that were in southern Indiana. So he sold all of his farmland in New York, uh, traded it off for hops, traveled to southern Indiana, got to southern Indiana, got to the Campbellsburg region where Cave River Valley is now, and found out that none of the distillers used hops and he lost everything that he had. A little while later on in history about the 1880s, because that story got bandied about so much, the school district in that area became known as the Hop District. Uh, a little later, it was tied together with another district called the Thompson District. So it was the Hop Thompson School District. And to this day, there exists a Hop Thompson uh, Cemetery, which is where most of the distillers from Cape River Valley are ironically buried at. So Interesting. Interesting. Well, we learned yeah, about hops from you, Steve. Um, yeah, that's right. Our, yeah, and it turned out that our gardener, Sarah, um, who is, if, if you ever get a chance to talk to her, she's one of the most studied, she's, she's very shy, but she knows more about farming in this region, the late 18th, early 19th century, than anybody I've ever known. Uh, but it turned out there was a nice hop vine just down the way from the distillery, uh, and it wasn't really being used for anything, so we started harvesting those hops to dry and use in the, um, in the, in the mash water when we remember them. So that's awesome. 
Aaron, it, you use them a couple times and it's, it really adjusts the pH quite a bit. Yeah. yeah um, to that, I'll add that I have nothing to add because there's no evidence of uh, Monongahela <laughs> rye distillers that I've seen ever using hops, uh, nor oats for that matter. But uh, looking at ledgers from the family company and, and other sources, I've never seen any of these local distilleries using hops. What was the, Aaron, what was the, the uh, corn content? that you guys are using in Pennsylvania. We were so corn heavy. What, how does that look in Pennsylvania? Zero. No corn whatsoever. Yeah. So typical Monongahela rye is almost all rye, but then malted barley, sometimes at a ratio of four to one, uh, sometimes like 80-20. So that was the, the mash bill. Um, no corn at all. Gotcha. I've got a, a before you jump on uh, to the brandy part of this, I have a question for Aaron and Steve in particular that I'm very curious of as a distiller. So Monongahela being a style, Maryland being a style, uh, obviously Kentucky nowadays has its own style, MGP kind of has its own style. Steve, do you have any, is, are there other, because I know that, you know, the George Washington distillery, it's, it's somewhere around 60, 65% corn, even historically. Do you know, is that a traditional thing in Virginia? And Aaron, maybe you can speak to this too from your, from your readings. Is that, is that, I mean, how did that kind of become a thing? Does anybody have any sort of insight on how that style was developed? I, I've been doing a little digging, trying to find out more about Virginia distilling. And so far what I've found is it's, there's no style like you see come out of Maryland that I can identify. I think there was a lot of corn whiskey in Virginia. I mean, that goes back to uh, Berkeley Plantation, 18, 16, 19, they record distillation there at Berkeley. Berkeley's the William Henry Harrison home plantation, so that's also interesting because that's where Taps was first played in 1863. Wow. Uh, so, but, but it, like everything, there's more digging to do. I have not determined there's a Virginia style. I think James Anderson, the farm manager, you know, he would have been known malt whiskey in Scotland, but being a businessman, he looked around the market and rye was what people wanted. I do know that Washington bought some rye from Maryland to, to use at the distillery. I just found that out recently. So what I wow. think it speaks to is what you said earlier is there's all sorts of styles because people were practical back then. You use what you had and then later you have specific like Monongahela and other styles that really develop for a region. And Aaron, I found newspaper advertisements from Monongahela rye in the 19th century in New Orleans for sale. So yeah. that would have been quite a journey for that whiskey. Yeah, I, I believe that. And you know, to your point about different styles, like if you ask the elitists or the purists about Monongahela rye, um, there's Monongahela rye and then there's not. <laughs> and it is like the, the best rye whiskey there is because, well, it's named geographically, of course, because it's, it's close to the Monongahela River, which goes from West Virginia and sort of snakes its way up into Pittsburgh where it meets with the Allegheny to form the Ohio. So these distillers that are making this Monongahela rye are either getting their water from the Monongahela River or its tributaries. So they're pretty close to that. And of course, the, the climate impacts the grain that they're growing, the rye that they're growing for their mash bill. And then by the end of the century, um, uh, 1900, um, they are steam heating their warehouses. So one distiller describes it as an eternal summer where they keep their, their warehouses at over 70 degrees all the time. Um, and I've already told you about their mash bill. So high rye, malted barley, nothing else. And then in Maryland, of course, they're mixing in corn. And I, in a, oh, sorry, I glitched out for a second. Um, a very simplified way to look at it that I kind of think of is in Pennsylvania at the time in the early 19th century, not very much corn is grown, but the further south you go, there's more and more corn. So the more and more corn you're seeing in the whiskey. And I don't know how that plays out in Virginia, but Maryland is uh, a lower rye and a higher corn compared to Monongahela. I Maryland was usually uh, a, a, a blended product a lot of times by the late 1800s and then also run on, on, on um, three chambers, at least by the 1880s or so, roughly. But that's really the only identifying characteristics of Maryland that I've ever seen. But I wonder if there might be a, a Scottish connection to that, that rye content in the George Washington, uh, Steve, because I know in, in Scotland, in certain areas, um, certainly in southern Scotland, uh, rye was fairly popular in whiskey at one point in time, malted rye. So I wonder if it's something that, that Anderson would have stumbled upon, across when he was there. He, he was likely exposed to it, I suppose. But uh, 
there's a book coming out hopefully this year by Dr. Bruce Ragsdale, who's teaches at Mount Vernon in our library occasionally, but it's all about Washington's farms. And there's a chapter he told me, which I've been trying to get from him, can't, where he went to Scotland and researched Anderson in his, what papers were there in Scotland. So I can't wait to see what he may have come what across. Because I do know Anderson was part of, he wrote Washington basically a resume letter and says, I ran mills, plural, that fed distilleries. So he was a pretty big merchant and a lot of that got shipped down to London to be redistilled into gin. And I think one of the reasons why Anderson left at that time was the British Parliament, uh, was well, the Scots refer to him, the people south of us, um, passed a law that was heavily gonna tax uh, Scottish spirits coming down. And I think he saw the writing on the wall and he immigrated. But uh, that's the neat thing about this, this locality, local markets fed into a lot of diversification of, of the work. And we think of today as brands being brands. I think it was much more fluid, pardon the pun, back then. There was a lot of people doing a lot of things because in the end they had to put bread on the table and they were creative. And uh, today I think we look at everything sometimes too much through brands, but that's the modern world. I think what I love about this is I think it, it leads us right back around to our first question, which is about agriculture. You know, now it's like distilling is an in, industry. You're whiskey, you're getting brandy. It's a novelty. You know, it's a luxury. But for these folks back then, this is part of the agricultural cycle, and that's what shaped these what became brands, but weren't yet. And Brian Austin, did you have something to throw in? I did. I, I had a, a little thought on it. It really is building on what's been said about you grow what you distill what you grow, and I was thinking so much about the 1790s and the Napoleonic Wars. So America adopted a political neutrality between England and France. But as far as economy, America enriched itself by supplying wheat and grain really to both sides. It's what got us into a lot of trouble. It's what eventually <laughs> would lead to a, the quasi war with France, the war with 1812. But at that point, the things like brandy, the things that were much more domestic, stopped being so essential because so much of what we were growing was corn, wheat, and rye. And at that point, at least for Virginia, I know from Madison's perspective, he, he starts looking much more in the 1790s into scientific farming, into crop rotations, into uh, focusing much more heavily on wheat, corn, and rye mm -hmm. in his farming. Now, it, what's interesting is sort of that still phase of his life, the peach brandy, all that kind of stuff, that kind of goes away. He doesn't take up distilling whiskey. But at that point, he focuses much more on the staple of that agricultural piece. And then that's one Virginia planter amongst many. But at that point, really 1790s is, is when we start seeing that transition. Again, we see the Whiskey Rebellion. We see that transition from brandy to those various spirits. And I, I do think it's because so many American farmers are turning towards those staples because those exports are what is enriching America at that point. And so it's, it's so interesting because sure, distilling is a domestic art, but it's influenced so much by the global economy as to what people are growing and from there, how to turn those things into the necessities that people depend upon. So yeah, I, I just had that thought. It wasn't a scholarly thing. I, w I wish I could source it. But yeah, like that, that's, that's just something I was thinking about. That's exactly right. And actually it is, you're, you hit the nail there because Washington in 1760s is running a tobacco farm. But what happens there is his land's exhausted. Uh -huh. And he had no more land to buy. He couldn't expand. And so he changed from tobacco to wheat in 1766 that built the merchant, merchant mill in 1770. And again, he's like you just said, he's, he's changing his economic system. And then you think the revolution happens and the French Revolution huge tobacco markets are lost to America overnight. And so there, therefore, what you just said is so true. Grains become predominant. And then, you know, even with export flour, we started exporting flour to the Caribbean in the 1690s and bringing back rum because once the colonies could feed themselves, they looked for markets. And so I think if you study history and don't study economics, you're not studying history. And so people do things for a reason. And I think uh, that's the way to look at this. They wouldn't have done it if it didn't bring a return. Yeah, I agree. That, and that's something I hadn't thought about. And it was a great point, Brian. Um, 
But if you go back and you look at some of the early publications on distilling in the United States, I hadn't really thought about it like that, but from between, say, 1790 and 1810, you'll find some really odd things in some of the old books, like, you know, people were distilling pumpkins or squash or turnips or <laughs> cabbage or whatever they could get a hold of, whatever they could ferment, you know, and, and so obviously the market uh, dictates changes, you know, and, and some of those products, I'm sure, obviously not cabbages or turnips or whatever, but some of them probably had some merit, but uh, economically, maybe they weren't, uh, they weren't feasible uh, at the time. So I think, I think that's a very valid point that I hadn't really, hadn't really considered before. Um, Alan, so are you advocating for a new uh, kimchi whiskey out of Southern Indiana? <laughs> <laughs> what was, what's the nose on that like? Do not tip me with a good time. I would start out with a baiju base. And uh, if I'm going to make something funky, I'm just going full on, buddy. <laughs> That was one of my dad. My dad was career army and he used to say to me and my brother when we were in trouble, he'd say, you're going to be in deep kimchi. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Steve said the word gin and I was, my first thought was we're going to be here all night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know we've all had some conversations about gin happening um, in both regions. Um, but let's, let, let's turn our attention a little bit to branding um, because it's something that I hadn't really considered a whole lot before uh, I know we, we started this project and I met Steve and met Alan um, and, and Alan you know pointing out to us especially that, that you know, it's just prohibition is what killed it it killed apple varieties it, it killed uh, brandy as a um, as a part of our spirit culture uh, in the United States so let's, let's, let's take a step back before prohibition back in the 18th century talk about apples and fruit and 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 where that fits uh, into the in the history of spirit culture in what's now the United States. I feel like that's a lot easier to trace too. So I, I think it'd be good to start with Steve and Aaron on that on the East Coast and then get to what it was on the West Coast. It's a little easier to track the way that that evolved over time because it stayed so farm distiller centric in my opinion, so. Yeah, I think, Aaron, you wanna go ahead? Uh, I was just gonna say that we actually don't know much about uh, the brandy of uh, our region. Uh, we know, from diaries that people were making brandy and uh, they're making apple brandy. But beyond that, honestly, I don't know much about it locally. Well, um, in Virginia as a state, what is interesting is we didn't have a lot of cities. You had Norfolk, which was a huge port. You had Alexandria, Georgetown, Lesser, and then Richmond develops later, but Williamsburg, of course, is the capital. But we had courthouses, and if you drive through Virginia, you'll see this is the such and such courthouse. So really, it was about these large tobacco plantations. But within those plantations, they had huge orchards, and so apple brandy and peach brandy, and even persimmon in Virginia was predominant from an early period. And they didn't age it much back then. Just like the whiskey, you can find accounts of Europeans complaining about this needs more time in the barrel. What they didn't realize is it that farmer probably put it in there for a week. It wasn't meant to go in the barrel for a period of time like what they knew on the continent. So when Washington, you know, inherits Mount Vernon, he inherits orchards. And I think that uh, those two early stills he bought, you know, back then he wasn't, he was still growing wheat, but I bet a lot of that produce from those orchards was going through those small stills. And you'll also find in other large planters like the Robert Carter Jr. of Namanai Hall, he was a grandson of King Carter. If you don't know about King Carter, he was one of the biggest landowners in Virginia in the early, late 1600s, early 1700s. They called him King because when he died, he had 44 plantations and about 300,000 acres of land. So all these descendants, there's these major plantations. And at Namanai Hall, they did a lot of brandy and they even bottled it. And that's interesting back then, but he owned the bottles. So for the local community, a big landowner, was the extra supplier when you ran out of the few bits of brandy you'd made on your own little farm. So it's interwoven there through uh, Virginia culture and I believe through Maryland. And uh, it was such, you know, just a part of the staple of, of the plantation with tobacco being the cash crop in those early days. Steve, there's a, there's a connection between uh, uh, Laird's and George Washington as well, correct? Yeah, you, I knew you might mention that, so I've got a bottle of Laird's right here. <laughs> so, um, now, this is funny, and I love Laird's, and, and Joe Dangler, a distiller who's at, made Virginia Gentleman for years, he's helped Laird's and loves Laird's, but 
they came down one time and told me about this story that Washington wrote them around 1760 to get a recipe for Applejack. And believe me, I've perused our records extensively and I didn't want to tell them it didn't happen. Maybe it happened, but, but uh, there's certainly that story that's connected Washington to the Laird's brand. But um, I think it's just, if you think of a working plantation, these sort of sustenance products were important because also liquor was given out at rash for rations at harvest. And sometimes that's rum, sometimes that's Applejack, sometimes that's brandy. And right. knowing how hot it gets in Virginia, I have fantasies about drinking a bunch of alcohol and then trying to cut wheat by hand in a hundred degree <laughs> day. That sounds like a great right. time. But you know what? Back in the back in the day, you better you better have it on hand if you want your neighbor to come help you because that was that was <laughs> requisite payments. <laughs> you know, got to provide good alcohol. So. And the other brandy story, I just briefly, I'll tell you, it's interesting, you know, Washington and Lafayette were like father and son. You know, Lafayette's uh, father died when Lafayette was very young. So he really, they were close. And there's a letter Washington writes Lafayette after he'd left America. And he said, I, I was looking for some brandy to send you, but I could find nothing that was really up to the par of what you have there in France. <laughs> And I, you know, rather than being ungentlemanly, he said, I just decided not to send any. And I think that's another part of these spirits. There's definitely imports with rum versus it in brandies versus what was continental work. Not to say that good brandy wasn't made here. They just aged it over there. Right. Uh, and so it makes a difference. But, and that leads to another story we can talk about later about bourbon, which I think Alan knows Michael Veach's story on some of that stuff in New Orleans. But that's all I have on brandy. Well, here in Indiana and Kentucky, it, it was a very cultural thing, brandy was. Um, and in the early days of the frontier, as well as statehood for both states, brandy sold, even locally produced brandy, sold at a, a vast premium over all types of whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, it was taxed heavier. Uh, it was considered a better quality product. Um, it was very well revered, which if you tell a bourbon lover that nowadays, you might get smacked in the face for saying that, you know, so they, they just, we always say that, uh, that brandy might be, especially apple or peach brandy might be bourbon's slightly more attractive older sister. So, um, which will also get you smacked in the face. But uh, the long and short of it is that a lot of the ancestry here in, in Kentucky and Indiana both is, uh, is German. Uh, and a lot of it comes from originally the Black Forest of Germany, and they had a long tradition of brandy production there, and they brought it with them here. The other part is Ireland doesn't get its fair shake in this, so Ireland has a very long history and tradition of producing apple brandy uh, that's just now starting to show back up in Ireland, uh, and so those cultures combined and came here, and uh, they put it to work. Now, they were very seasonal, obviously, because apples in particular uh, you know, they don't last very long. So their season was, you know, basically from August until January every year. It was always pot distilled. You know, small farm producers, even by the time of industrialization, they're making somewhere between three upwards to 1,200 barrels of, uh, of apple brandy a year. And to kind of put that in perspective, because it doesn't sound like a whole lot, uh, you know, you're looking at one to three bushels of apples to make one gallon of brandy. So if you're talking about a distillery running pot stills from August until January, to get 1,200 barrels, 48 gallon barrels at the time, uh, you're talking about guys that were literally running 24 seven on these pot stills all the time, primarily farm distillers. But it was such a big part of what we did here that by the 1850s, if you go into the, in Southern Indiana, into the agricultural census book, you will basically find that um, in 1855, that six county region that I mentioned earlier, the Black Horse of Southern Indiana, had upwards of 155,000 apple trees per county. Now, these apples have not been selected to eat out of hand. Cider was never a big thing in the Midwest, um, or even in, in Kentucky, it was not a huge deal. Uh, these apples were grown specifically for distillation. They were grown from seeds, uh, from apples that were planted previously. You know, when they would, uh, when they would run their brandy, they'd take their seeds and plant them back every year and select the best ones. Uh, it's also one of the things that doomed apple brandy for us as, a, as a, a state in southern Indiana, as well as the brandy distillers in Kentucky, because when prohibition hit, uh, these apples aren't any good to eat out of hand. Uh, you know, they're, they're kind of worthless to everybody at that point in time. So unless you're a moonshine or whatever. Um, peach brandy was a big deal. Uh, Steve, I may have discussed this with you before. I don't know. But uh, one of the very, well, the very first white settler that we know of in 
um, Southern Indiana and Washington County was, a, well, not the first settler, but the first one that really registered land legally in Washington County, Indiana was a man named uh, John Fleener. And John and his brother Abraham were actually from Tidewater, Virginia. Their father was an apple brand and distiller there. And uh, Abraham was an orchardist. And when they moved here, they brought with them uh, a little white clean stone peach. Uh, it's not a very good peach to eat out of hand, but it's an excellent distilling peach. The only thing it was ever really used for is distilling and pickling. Uh, they brought that here and pretty much every distillery made a go of that particular peach variety uh, for 60, 70 years. And to this day, because it comes true from seed, every old distillery site that I've ever been to that's still extant to some extent has a bunch of these wild fleener peaches growing around it. Um, it again, it's very much culturally oriented. Uh, Mr. Fleener as well, I should mention while I'm on here because it's kind of fun. Uh, anybody who has family from Indiana, you're probably related to Mr. Fleener because he had 23 children. Um, he was married three times. Uh, and he was also the first man in Indiana before it was even a state to have a divorce because his first wife would not move here with him from Virginia. So, uh, there's a reason. Just, yeah, right. <laughs> he would let me tell you, he was li he was living in the middle of nowhere when he got here, and he lived like that for about eight years before he had a neighbor. So, wow. um, I don't blame her. No. Well, it, that's where you think of. We all have heard the Johnny Appleseed story. When you're a kid. I know growing up, I thought, oh, yeah, apples, we, you know, you eat apples. Those were being spread for the purposes of cider and, and also distilling, correct? Yes, definitely. That was, that was a big part of it. And claiming land in the, here on the frontier, you know, you had to plant, if you wanted to claim land, you had to plant an apple tree because it showed that you had a commitment to that land mm -hmm. uh, in order to farm it. Um, you know, and that, that's really all it took. You could claim ever so how, however many acres for every apple tree you had planted on a certain plot, you know, and it showed that you had a long-term commitment to be there. Um, you know, an apple seed came through Indiana quite often. In fact, it's buried in Indiana. So uh, might explain why he seemed so happy in that Disney movie. He was drinking a little <laughs> apple jack. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've only got a few minutes left before moving into questions, and one, one thing that's kind of been on my mind as we've been talking about being in the fields, doing the work and all that, we've got four different places here. We were going from Virginia to Pennsylvania to Kentucky to Indiana, and talking about who is exactly doing the distilling. We've got uh, the Scottish farm manager bringing distilling to Mount Vernon. Uh, we know at Locust Grove that nearly, if not totally, our entire workforce uh, were enslaved African Americans. Uh, slavery was legal in Indiana Territory, uh, Indiana became a free state in 1816. Um, so for us at Locust Grove, part of our story um, is crop processing. Um, and I think uh, I think our, our director, Dr. Carol Ely, uh, is here. And, and one of the things that she really drove home to me a few years ago uh, is that when you look at the work on a farm, you're primarily looking at men involved in crop production and women involved, or involved in crop processing. Uh, now that there wasn't carryover uh, between the two. So, so we feel like a little bit stronger when we're looking, as far as distilling goes, at the history of the work of enslaved African-American women. Uh, so where, where does that translate in the different places uh, that, that we're talking about today? Well, well at Mount Vernon, what's um, interesting to work here is that we have thousands of documents related to Washington's farms, and we have the entire slave uh, uh, population inventories that Washington did at different periods and so at the distillery were six young African-American men and they're listed as distillers in that in that document and they had two paid staff James Anderson's son John was the daily manager and lived there in the distillery and he had an assistant distiller and um, having rode a lot of mash by hand these last many years I have deep regard for those guys that made that whiskey that way because in 1799, they made 11,000 gallons at Mount Vernon. And that's just astronomical amount doing it that way. And uh, these were highly skilled men. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of them was a boy, Timothy, of 14 years old. Uh, also on the mill site, you had four to six coopers making barrels for not only the, the mill and distillery, but the fishing operation. And then uh, in the mill, there was paid millers, but also a miller named Ben who was there for many years. And we even have a letter from George Washington to a neighbor referring to Ben and he states he knows the milling business very well. So I think that impact of those men, the business wouldn't have gone forward. Um, it wouldn't have happened. And, and I think about them because we get to go home. 
you know, uh, they, you know, they turned right around the next day to make 11,000 gallons. Like I was in there yesterday running some stills and uh, we, we got interrupted during, you know, mid production with all that's going on. And, uh, and I get to go home and clean up and those guys just started another batch. Right. So I think you will find that throughout these estates and also into the 19th century, as we know about the, you know, nearest green and other, other stories that are out there that, uh, there's heavily uh, talented people working in this industry uh, to create these unique, unique whiskeys. And, and again, like I said, in that time period, though, they, they didn't have the right to leave the property. And uh, I think that's true in all these areas. We're, and not to cut you off, but it's like, I think it's important to remember that we're not, we're not, not, not there's anything that the people were, that there were laborers like in the, in the, in the late period, uh, complaint takes real less people, but we're, we're talking about skilled artisans, you know, people with real ability, like, like, like really skilled uh, human beings that had knowledge that we can't even, we're, we're, we're spending our whole lives trying to discover, basically. Well, if I could just, one short story, I, I read a book years ago called Industrial Slavery, and it was interesting because we, we think about the human dynamic in this, and this uh, story of this one man that owned an iron furnace in Virginia, and he, one of his enslaved workers was an incredible iron maker. And, and it got late summer in, in Virginia, and it was so damn hot, this enslaved worker left the plantation to see a girlfriend he had on another plantation. But the owner didn't go after him. He wrote a letter bitching about it to his friend, his neighbor, but he waited, and when the weather got better, the guy came back, fired up the furnace, and what it was was he needed that guy. Yeah. And yeah. so it, it, it got to the point where, local people would not rent other slaves to that furnace because these slaves worked there for a few days but saw how that iron maker was treated and you start you're a human being you go well, why am i treated that way and this guy's well that guy had a mastery of a subject so i think this when we study uh, this topic what i like is we can bring the lives of those people alive at mount vernon through the various interpretations that we do not just in the distillery but on the farm and you mentioned pl uh, field work most of the people that push plows at Mount Vernon were women. And so every place is a little different, but I think that's part of our role. Our mission is to not just tell the great story of George Washington, but the people that lived and worked at Mount Vernon and yeah. made, it, made it function so that in many ways he was able to operate on that larger public level that he did. And I think it's, I believe in telling, you know, history's history, you tell the whole story. And, Absolutely. and, and I think you do that there. Colonial Williamsburg does it well. Uh, everywhere all of us work, it's part of our duty to do so. Yeah, and, and those, you know, those slaves are so highly valued, you know, not, not as people often, obviously, unfortunately, but they had talent. They knew what they were doing, you know, in the deep south, even, even the slaves that were distillers, um, you know, making, you know, turpentine and pine spirits, they, often the, the rewards for those escaped slaves were higher than any one other that you saw because they were so talented and it wasn't something that you could just teach just to anybody and I'll, I'll tell you right now that having been to, to Mount Vernon and of course Brian and I we used 53 gallons instead of 120 gallon I am fat and I'm out of shape and let me tell you what it doesn't matter how good a shape that I would have been in there ain't no way I would have kept rolling rowing 120 gallon hogshead fermenters every single day and not just been tore up so all the respect in the world plus cutting the wood and doing the whole thing you know in, in Indiana it's kind of the same thing it doesn't get talked about so everybody thinks of Indiana as a union state um, and it was for the most part although the southern part of the state was probably more confederate than it was union unfortunately in some aspects um, one of the great blights on southern indiana history is how little we know about the slaves that were here in southern indiana because it was actually legal here in southern indiana to hold someone in bondage until 1855 uh, but what you did they had a way around it right so it wasn't legal to have slaves here but you could hold someone for five months and 29 days and then they had to go back to a slave state mm -hmm. and then they could come back and you could hold them for another five months and 29 days so all you had to do was take your slaves across the river and bring them back up here. So one of the things that I've been on the trail of is um, there's a gentleman from Jessamine County, Kentucky named Benjamin Radcliffe who owned a big distillery out by Hardensburg, Indiana. And uh, when he moved up here, he, from Jessamine County, he basically took his father's distillery and his father's slaves and brought them up here and he freed them. 
And we know that those slaves work his distillery. We know that they are buried in the same cemetery that he is, and he's actually buried right next to where they are. Um, but finding any information whatsoever, uh, you know, about those those people who had previously been enslaved in Kentucky that he brought up here um, is almost impossible. And I'm sure that there were other distillers that came to Southern Indiana that had slaves in whatever state they came from who they brought up here and used that five months and 29 days rule because who's going to be able to prove that and who's going to check it anyways. Uh, and it's not talked about in Hoosier history whatsoever. Um, you know, to their advantage. And I would love to hear those stories or find those stories. And unfortunately, a lot of them are lost. And it's it's a, it's a, a deep and sad tragedy that we can't find those people's stories. And that's the other thing I'll say about being at Mount Vernon, Steve. That's one of the coolest things that I thought about when I was there working. You know, there was a day when I was there where everybody but me, you, and Sean Stevens had went to lunch. And so you left it up to, to me and Sean to try to run pretty much all the stills. And I thought, this is cool for about an hour and a half. And then after about an hour and a half, I was like, how in the hell did six people do this all the time, you know, and just, and deal with it. it and, and to walk in their footsteps, you know, uh, and I love George Washington, revere George Washington, but it's almost just as cool to walk in their footsteps and see what they lived through. So. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, let's move into a few questions. As I thought, an hour and a half is going by very fast. Um, so we've got 10 minutes. Aaron, Aaron had one comment. I know. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Let Aaron. No, it's it's fine. I, I didn't want to detract from the conversation about slavery. Um, but in West Overton, we have no evidence, of course, of any enslaved people. And as a matter of fact, um, everybody who worked in this village over the course of the 19th century until the 1870s, 1880s, were Pennsylvania born uh, Caucasian folks, white folks. Initially in the early 1800s, Abraham Overholt mans this still, this two pot still distillery of 150 gallon capacity. But as it expands over the 19th century, there emerges three classes of workers. So the Overholts are managers, and then they have this class of artisans, like the Coopers. And then there's a class of unskilled laborers who work the mill, who work the farm, who work the distillery. And all of these folks rent from the Overholt company. So it's sort of an early model of company town that becomes very common around here in the coal mining industry in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century. So um, by the mid part of the century, 1860s, 70s and 80s, although immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe are beginning to populate the village, um, it's largely the overholts and then this, this sort of three tier system of, uh, of laborers who, who are man our distillery and uh, who work in the village. That was all. That's interesting, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we're we're probably only going to get to a few questions before we have to move into wrapping up, but I think um, Hannah's going to have our contact information, everything ready, um, so you can get in touch with us if you'd like to chat more. Obviously, we all like to chat about this stuff, so we're happy to. Um, well, a couple of the top ones, Mark and Brenda from our Ontario, Canada are with us. They would uh, they say, drinking family heirloom whiskey, old Overholt. Aaron, is the whiskey being distilled at the West Overton, is the whiskey being distilled at West Overton Homestead? Yeah, yeah. So West Overton Village is a historic village of 20 buildings, and it is the original home and town of the Overholt family. And we have renovated one of our mid-19th century barns that now houses our, our modern rye whiskey educational distillery. Now, we can't make Old Overholt because Jim Beam makes that, mm -hmm. and we can't make their other historically associated brand, Old Farm, because I'm a descendant of the Overholt family owns that and they they're they're owning that so we're making sort of our own thing but yeah we are distilling on the same ground where abraham overholt did since 1803 that's awesome yeah that's excellent and this is in the same vein uh did they ever toast rye grains like they do the barley for scotch so i think steve could probably talk more to this but um i'm not sure if you're thinking of malting where you allow your grain to sprout and then dry it out and sometimes toast it but no um it was rye grain with malted barley uh, that was used in the mash bill. And that's and one, of the, that's oh, one of the questions we have is, was some of the malt at Mount Vernon malted, not just the barley component, which the mash bill is, the original one is lower on malt barley than I'd expected, which makes me wonder if they didn't malt some of that, because there was a malt house right there on the property by the distillery. Yeah, I, Steve, I should add that there is evidence of, of throughout the 1800s of some Monongahela rye distilleries malting their rye, and there was a malt house 
uh, at Westover since as early as the 1850s. So I should put a disclaimer that it's possible that they were malting some of their rye. Steve, you and I talked about that one time. Um, and what I've discovered since then is that rye itself actually has a small amount of diastatic power. Um, so they, they may not have been malting any, which surprised me. Um, but as another side that's not malting, that's kind of interesting on rye whiskey, if you get into Southern Ohio, Southern Indiana, and even sometimes Northern Kentucky in the very early days, they weren't using oak barrels to age rye whiskey. They were using hickory barrels. So hmm. yeah, kind of a weird little, little aside there. Hmm. Well, luckily that pretty much addressed our, our, another big question we had was about malting. Um, so yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we are getting close to time to wrap up. As, as I suspected, I think we've really only scratched the surface uh, of what we could discuss here. Uh, I'm going to toss it back to Brian Austin for our third and final toast of the night. Yeah. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, you know, I know this is kind of an experiment. It's it's the first time something like this is is happening between you know, all these institutions, but it's not going to be the last. We're looking forward to other punch bowls with other subjects. Um, and I, I invite all of you to focus on the Odyssey Project, looking forward to uh, other collaborations that we can do. You know, I think something that's great is that this, um, this current place that we're at is not going to last forever, but the lessons that we learn from it and how we can collaborate, they can go on. So um, I'm, I'm so, I feel so blessed to represent my museum in working with a museum hundreds of miles away and other institutions hundreds of miles away. Um, I feel so overwhelmed by everything I've learned over the course of this and I think I could do it all night. And so uh, I'm so grateful for everybody who participated today uh, to be a part of this first kind of experiment. So this next post uh, and I've, I've tried to keep it mostly 18th century or under, it's sort of a price is right kind of thing. I don't want to overbid on our time periods. Uh, <laughs> so this, this last toast is from Thomas Moore, and uh, it has to deal with past, present, and future. And I think that, you know, I know today in Virginia, it's the first day we're trying to open up again, wherever you're from and whatever you're doing. Uh, I think it, it relates all the same. Uh, so please raise your glasses, uh, then fill the bowl away with care. Our joy shall always last our hopes, shall brighten our days to come, and memory gild the past. Cheers to all of you. Cheers. Hey, Brian Austin. I have one. I have one that I want to share with you, and I think I've shared it with Brian Cushing, and I'm going to share, share with Aaron and Steve Bayshore now, because you'll enjoy it. Do you? I, do any I, of you know? Now, the, let's, let's let's have a toast fireworks show. We're going to do it. <laughs> do you know the old uh, the old Irish poutine toasts? Uh, I don't. I, I'm excited to learn it. It's a good one. So this is for those that wish us well, and those who don't may go to hell. <laughs> You know, we're on grand finale. I'll, I'll do the ones that I haven't, I, I wasn't going to use. Okay. So here's, uh, uh, here's one for Kentucky. So this is for you, Brian. When the mint is in the liquor, its fragrance is in the glass. It breathes a recollection that can never, never pass. Indeed, my friend. <laughs> well, does anybody have any final thoughts before we wrap up this wonderful session? I do. <laughs> <laughs> One more toast. Yeah. Round section. So uh, this is Barbados. So to wives and girlfriends, may they never meet. Yeah. <laughs> I went up her. Yeah. I have one. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, okay. Let's see if I can remember it. All right. Um, here's to our enemies. May they have spider web britches, porcupine saddles, and a hard trotting journey home. <laughs> Cheers. Well, if I'm not mistaken, there are no enemies here, only friends. Um, so if, I'm gonna let Brian give us a last wrap up, but I do have a quick technical announcement.
Um, you will not receive very many emails from me if you do not already regularly receive emails from me. You will receive one email from me in about 15 minutes that will be all of our um, contact information so you can ask those questions that didn't get answered directly to um, your panelists today. Um, we will also um, send out the um, link when it, once it is available um, through however you found out about this event. So if you found out about it from Locust Grove, you'll get it from Locust Grove. If you found out from Spirits of French Lick, you'll find out about it from Spirits of French Lick, and so on. Um, there's also a feedback form in that email. If you enjoyed this and want to do it again, let us know. Um, if you um, have some suggestions or you just want to tell the uh, gents how what a great job they did and how they, you could have left them talking for hours, that's fantastic too. Um, we so appreciate you um, all being with us today from Louisville to New Orleans to Munich, Germany to wherever you're visiting us from. It was just great to have you. So Brian Cushing, you've got 30 seconds for some final words before I end this. Thanks everybody. Uh, mostly, I hand covered some of the ground that I wanted to cover. So just, uh, this is this is Punch Bowl 1. Uh, so that means there's going to be more Punch Bowls. Uh, so just however you're keeping up with Locust Grove, uh, watch out for the notifications on that. If you're not keeping up with Locust Grove, uh, there's a whole slew of ways you can do that. Uh, so look for the next Punch Bowl. If you've got suggestions, if you've got questions, let us know. I just really want to thank everybody for being here with us tonight. I am very fortunate to work at a place uh, that has been a journey of passion for me. I, I came to Locust Grove as a volunteer at the age of 17 in 1999. And what the distillery project has really brought together is other people that are passionate about the subject matter that we're talking about, this broad subject, which we really had here tonight. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I really look forward to the next time we can all be together either virtually or in person. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye, y'all.